at the detail of the algorithm that we're discussing yesterday. So this is the uh, this is the code snippet that we looked at yesterday. Uh, one iteration of the loop. Okay. I have also numbered the instructions as they will appear in the dynamic sequence. So this is one iteration, the first one. This is second iteration. This is third iteration, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So essentially, we are going to execute this on our model that we discussed yesterday. We have a single issue queue. So this is my issue queue. Okay, all right. Um, so I haven't shown uh, what it really contains. Um, so the idea is that um, instructions will be fetched in that order as numbered. Okay. Um, will be decoded in that order. Okay. And will be allocated in the queue in that order. All right. So essentially, the instructions will sit in the queue exactly in that order. Okay. In the, in the order of the instructions shown there. And then from the queue, we'll select instructions and execute them. Okay, all right. So, any question on yesterday's uh, material or any doubt that you might have on this model? Okay, so, so I'll, what I'm going to do is so each queue entry is going to have, um, of course, it will have a slot ID, which is the ID of the queue entry. Okay. Um, it will have a bunch of source registers and um, one, um, at most one, destination register. Okay. All right. So let's take the first instruction there. Okay. Um, so it's number one. Source dollar a zero. And destination dollar v zero. So for execution purpose, of course, I'll have to also remember the opcode, et cetera. Okay, all right. Any other argument, like for example, the immediate argument also I'll require. I'm not showing them here. Okay. So I'll put the destination at the top. That's my first iteration. Right? So this is a source one, source two, dest.
etc. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. So that's the order in which uh, instructions will be allocated in the queue. Okay. Now, when you allocate an instruction, I need to know if the instruction can. Okay. So let me tell you the remaining pipeline stages. So that might help you to visualize what's going to happen in the future. So next stage is called wake up. Then there is a select issue stage. And then the usual execution, memory, write back. Okay. So the wake up stage essentially wakes up any waiting instruction okay, that might be waiting for the operands. Okay. So um, when I allocate an instruction, I need to know if the instruction can be selected in the next cycle. All right. So the instructions which are ready, they will actually skip this particular stage. There won't be any wake up stage for them. Okay. All right. So how do I know that when I allocate a new instruction? How do I know if it can be, if it can participate in the selection in the next cycle? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you figure this out? So let's suppose that um, I'm fetching in this order, right? The first instruction comes, uh, queue is empty, so nothing needs to be checked. So I I'll actually uh, put a ready bit here. Okay. So in this case, the ready bit is going to be one, all right? Meaning that next cycle it can execute, all right? No constraint on this. So this is a ready bit. What about the second instruction? So I take dollar a zero and compare with why is that? Because this instruction is currently sitting in the queue with the destination v zero. So will that be a correct algorithm all the time? Should I compare with all the instructions before me, the destination of all of them? Does everybody see that? Okay. So. Um, at any point in time, whenever I put an instruction in the queue, it needs to compare its sources with destinations of all the instructions before it. Is there any way to optimize this? This is a lot of search, actually. For every instruction, you have to do you know, a linear search. And whatever way you want to implement it, there will be a linear number of comparisons. Any way to optimize it? Remember that uh, we discussed last time that as soon as the instruction executes, I may not write it to the register file. I have to wait until um, its, its uh, turn comes. For example, seventh instruction may execute now, but it will, it will not be able to write it until everything else before it um, has written to the register file. Sorry? No, 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 it's not the question of bypass, right? I cannot write it to the file because there may be an exception that. I may have to handle the seventh instruction writes to the file, fifth one takes an exception. How do I recover the register file now? So on, on right back, you, on, on right back huh. you make that binary as zero. On a right back, I make the binary as zero. Okay, all right. Um, yes, so what he has suggested is that I prepare a table. All right. What does the table store? It tells me for each register, so each entry contains, so let's suppose we have uh, in MIPS we have 32 registers, right? So this is going to have 32 entries, right? Is that what you're saying? A, a particular entry, for example, let's suppose the entry for register 1, all right, will tell me the slot ID in the queue for the instruction which generated this register for the last time which was the last producer of this particular register. Okay. So whenever an instruction shows up with this source register, I look up the table and immediately know who I depend on. Okay. Because all I care about is the last instruction to produce this value. Okay. I don't care about anybody else before it actually. Is that correct? Okay. So for example here, um, this instruction cares only about this particular instruction. It doesn't care about anybody else in this particular sequence. Okay, all right. 
Okay, so so let's try to populate this register. So, so this table. So the first instruction comes, the entry for dollar v zero will get populated with one, all right, and we'll also have a valid bit. So that's his yes no uh, binary thing. Okay, right. So this valid bit is normally zero. I'll mark it one. Whenever an instruction shows up with this particular, so I'm assuming that this is the entry for dollar uh, v zero. Okay, whatever that is. All right. So when I bring this instruction in, it looks up this table, goes to the entry for a zero, finds that it's actually invalid, which means I don't I don't depend on anybody. All right. So essentially, this instruction is also ready to execute. Okay. Next, I bring in this one. So also, I establish dollar v one entry. So let's suppose this is v one. This becomes two. Valid. Okay. All right. So then this instruction comes. So it is dollar a one. Uh, it requires dollar a one. Produces dollar a one. Looks up the entry for dollar a one. It's invalid. Doesn't depend on anybody. So it's ready to go. So let's suppose this is my dollar a one entry. I mark it three, make it valid, right? Because it's it's also producing dollar a one. Okay. Next instruction comes. It needs to look up two things, v zero and v one. Okay. It looks up v zero, so it finds that it depends on one. Okay. It looks up v one, it depends on two. All right. So that's what it marks here. So it's not ready to execute, and it has a dependence list. At most, two things it can depend on a particular instruction because it has two sources. What are what what are the dependencies? One and two. It depends on these two slots. Okay. All right. So this is my uh, I depend on these two things. All right. What about the next one? Okay, so it produces v zero. Now something interesting is going to happen. So it's going to override v zero, right? Okay. So I'm going to change this entry now because the new incarnation of v zero is actually four. Okay. Then this one comes. It it also needs two things, a zero and v zero. So it looks up a zero. Yeah. Uh, a zero is free, but uh, v zero comes from four, so this is also not ready to execute. And it's uh, uh, a zero is free, but v zero has a dependence on four. Okay, all right. So so on and so forth. You, as the instruction comes, you look up this table. Um, so store doesn't produce any value, so I don't change this table on this instruction. You look up this table, find out who it depends on, and that's how you. Fill up this queue. Okay, all right. Is this step clear? What the allocate stage does exactly? Okay, all right. It's a, it just picks up the next free entry in the queue, and um, fills up these particular slots, whatever it is, okay. and that's it. That's what the allocate stage is doing. Okay. Any question? All right. So uh, we'll come to this stage uh, very soon. Let's skip over to the select stage. Okay. So it's the select stage. What it does is that it picks up the entries with the ready bit on, okay, and selects a subset of those for execution. Okay, it can select any subset for that matter. Okay, all right. So we discussed that also a couple of lectures ago that um, instructions which are ready can execute in any order. Okay, all right. Um, so let's suppose that uh, for this particular cycle, it selects these three instructions. Okay, all right. So it assumes few things. When you say that it selects these three instructions, that means I have. So what are these three instructions? Two loads and one add. Okay. So for these three instructions to execute together in this particular cycle, so essentially they will move on to the execution stage in the next cycle. Oh, sorry, I've missed one stage. Okay, so um, so in this stage, essentially the the selection hardware says that you can issue these three instructions um, 
in the next cycle, which means they will go to go and access the register file. Okay, all right. So these three instructions do not depend on anybody. Okay, so they will go and access their source registers. So in this case, they need dollar a zero, dollar a zero, and dollar a one. All right. So as soon as you say that, you will implicitly say something about the register file organization. You say that the register file is designed in such a way that it can source three operands in a cycle because in this case you need three. Okay, all right. And in fact, when you say that I, am, I can issue three instructions every cycle, in the worst case, you should be prepared to source six operands. Okay, right. So in this case, it just happened that these three instructions did not have a second source. Is it clear to everybody? This particular thing. Okay. All right. So the, so so essentially, what I'm saying is that how much you can issue in a cycle depends on number of available ports in your register file, how many source operands you can get in a cycle. Okay. All right, so that's about your register file. Now we want to execute two loads and one add instruction in a cycle, right? Okay. So that means what? What kind of functional units do I need to be able to do that? Sorry, louder? Three adders. Why three adders? Exactly, two for generating the address of these two instructions and one for actually computing this instruction, okay, right? So I need three adders. So that's another implicit um, assumption that we're making when you say that I can actually execute these three in a cycle, okay? So with, what this means is that it puts one more constraint on the selection hardware. It should be aware of what are the functional units that are available in the machine, okay? It cannot just pick an arbitrary subset. So gradually restricting the subset, you can see that. First we say that, you depend on number of read ports in the register file, how much you can read in a cycle. And then we're saying that how, what mix of functional units you have, that also decides what subset you can actually issue, okay. So you need three adders, what else? What else do I need to execute those three instructions in a cycle? Yes, louder. Two memory ports, yeah. So I should be able to do two load instructions in a cycle, okay, all right. So I need two, two data memory ports, okay. So then I'm, if I have three adders and two data memory ports, then I'm ready to send those three instructions to the execution unit and they can execute concurrently without any problem, okay. All right, so what happens after they finish executing? Okay, so essentially we're going to turn these bits to zero ready bits because they have essentially executed, okay, all right. They are not eligible for participating in future selection, okay, all right. Now the question arises that where do I put the values that these three instructions produce? I cannot send them to the register file, okay, all right, um, because it may not be time yet. So we create one more entry here, which is the value. So here, it will store the value of the load. So the values will be filled up here, here, and here. Okay, all right. What else has to happen? You have to wake up the waiting instructions, okay, that are waiting on me. Okay. So how do I achieve that? So what happens is that whenever an instruction finishes, it will broadcast its Q slot ID. Over, the, over all the entries, okay. So whenever this load instruction completes, it will essentially send this particular entry ID to everybody in this queue, okay, all right. And everybody else's job is to pick up this slot ID and compare with these two entries here, okay. If there is a match, that means one dependence has been resolved. Okay. This particular operand is ready. So for example, in this case, one will match this one, okay and essentially this will go away, okay. That means this is no longer dependent on this instruction, okay. This instruction when completes will broadcast two and this will also go away. And when both go away, this bit will become on, okay. So this is ready to execute now, all right. So in the next cycle, it will actually um, contain for um, selection. So this is the wake up cycle that this instruction goes through. Okay, and you can see that an instruction can have at most two wake up cycles. In a particular cycle, one particular dependent dependence may get resolved. In another cycle, another dependence may get resolved. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that. Yes, right. So where is it going to read the value, right? So in this case, it needs v0 and v1, right? Okay. So essentially, these two slots will give you the register value. Okay. So it is not going to read from the register file, but it will actually going to read from the dependent queue slots. Remember that the values are stored here. Okay. All right. Well, it was recording the dependents. No, 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 not yet. We read the value in this stage. Yeah, so I'm coming to that. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm avoiding the, the hard corner cases. I'm just trying to describe that basic algorithm. Okay. All right, so this is now ready to go. This is not yet ready to go. All right. And there will be many other instructions which are ready to go. I haven't shown actually. You can fill up the queue and see. Okay, all right. Okay, now, so in the next cycle, this instruction is now eligible to participate in selection. All right. So let's assume that the selection hardware selects this particular instruction. Okay. All right. So now, in the next cycle, this instruction has to read the register file. Okay. So now the question arises: the value may not be in the register file. Okay. The value may be sitting here actually, right, in these two slots. Okay. Right. So essentially, now you interpret these two entries in a different way. Okay. You figure out if. Uh, if these two, these two, you know, these two entries essentially tell you where to get the value from. So in this case, you'll get the value from these two slots, and go to the execution unit, complete execution, broadcast your slot ID. Now you will essentially going to wake up this one, okay? Because this has four, so four will match actually. Okay, all right. So um, and uh, that instruction will issue, and finally, uh, a time will come when you want to write back. And the write back will, ha will happen in this order exactly. Okay. For example, this instruction, the first one, is eligible for write back as soon as it completes because it's the head of the queue. Okay. So when, when the time comes to write back, essentially what will happen is that it will pick up this destination ID, pick up the value, send it to the register file. Okay. And this queue, this queue entry will become free. So if you design it as a circular queue, the pointer will move. That entry will become now eligible for allocation. All right, is the basic algorithm clear? Okay. So, any question? So, one point to notice is um, that we have implicitly done renaming. That's one point. Okay. Uh, because essentially, we are using these um, these queue entries as an alternate name for the destination registers. For example, here I could execute um, two instructions with the same destination without any problem. Okay. Because they essentially hold the values in two different slots in the queue. Okay. And they will write back to the register file in this particular order. So I can concurrently execute them. Of course, in this case, there was a dependence, which is why I could not concurrently execute them. Um, uh, but otherwise, if there was no dependence, I could actually. Um, also notice that I can also resolve memory dependence because the store value here. Um, so what happens is that when the store instruction executes this particular one, um, the value actually still remains here. It doesn't go to memory yet because it cannot. Only when the store comes to the head of the queue, this value will be moved to the memory. Okay, so then the question arises, what does it mean to issue a store instruction then? So in this particular model, it actually does nothing. Okay. You cannot do the store at this point. Why is that? Why? There might be a load before it. Mm, there might be a load before it. There might be a load after it. Uh, which? What's the problem then? Yes, you should need the new value. That's fine. Yeah. The load won't get to know that it is has the same address. Right. Okay. So that's one problem. So for now, let's assume that because of exception, I cannot send it to memory. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm coming to your point very soon. 
So the store cannot really modify memory yet because there may be a chance that an instruction here may take an exception. Okay. Then you, you cannot modify memory okay, until it trans comes. Okay. So that also gives you memory renaming essentially because now I can have two store instructions in this queue going to the same address. Okay. They can sit in two different slots. All right. So when you introduce caches, we'll see that actually it makes sense to issue a store early. Okay. There, are, there is some meaning, but for now, there is no meaning actually, it doesn't do anything. Okay. It just sits there with the value. When it comes to the head, it will send it to memory. Okay. All right. Now what he has mentioned, we discussed this also yesterday, that suppose, so this is a store instruction, right? This one here. This particular entry is a store instruction. It writes to some address, which is this. And we don't know until the store instruction is issued and it executes. So in this particular pipe stage, I actually get to know the address of the store. Okay, all right. Now let's suppose that, um, so here our ninth instruction is a load, right? This one. Right, ninth instruction is a load instruction. Okay. And um, the address of which is also we do, I do not know until it issues and executes. But on the face of it, if you just look at it, okay, right? I could have actually issued ninth instruction along with one, two, and three, because it would be ready. Because dollar a zero um, is uh, oh, sorry, yes, it cannot because it depends on this actually. Okay, all right. In this case, I have a dependence, so which is why it cannot. Uh, but if I did not have a dependence, then I could have issued actually nine with one, two, three, skipping over the store here which may be a problem, which we discussed yesterday, because it may be a problem if the, the, these two addresses are same. Okay, then the ninth, this load will take, get a wrong value from memory. It should be getting the value from this store only. Okay. The problem is that I cannot really resolve it until both of these are issued and executed. Then only I get to know the address. So, so that's a big problem, and which is why often what you would do is, you would not issue a load if it has a store before it. Okay. All right. So you will you'll wait until fifth instruction is gone from the queue, it is executed, so that you know its address. You can store the address in a, in a slot in the queue. Okay. And this instruction can compare and it can figure out okay, whether it can issue or it has to wait or whatever. Is the basic algorithm clear? What's happening? Okay. So this is uh, called uh, Tomasulo's algorithm. Um, after the name of Robert Tomasilo, um, an IBM engineer um, who came up with this particular systematic way of uh, maximizing ILP um, for the IBM 360 machine. Uh, it has many different descriptions. This is just one of those many. Uh, the book has a different description uh, which we'll go through very soon. Um, but the, the, the crux of it is this, that you keep track of dependencies, you have a table to know who you depend on, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now there are small issues that are left, um, which actually can be troublesome, okay, which you have to think about. Um, the first question is, um, let's suppose that the instruction that produces, so currently V0 is produced by 4, right, V0 is produced by 4, okay, all right. And for some reason, what happens is that this instruction is not fetched. Okay, nothing beyond it is fetched. All right. So this is the last instruction that produces V0 in the queue. Okay, and everything onward is not fetched yet. Okay. So eventually, time will come when this instruction will write back. Okay, right. So at that point, essentially, what it means is that V0 is no longer held by four. It's in the register file. Right. So at that time, I actually turn this off. This bit goes to zero. All right. So that's what he has mentioned. That when you write back to the register file, you can mark this entry as invalid. Okay. All right. So that means v0 is not in the queue anymore. If you want to read v0, it's ready in the register file. You can get the value from there. Okay. All right. Any question? Okay. All right. 
So the second question is, it may happen that, so we said that when you allocate, you read this table, right, to find out who you depend on, okay, which, which slot is producing your sources. So there may be a race going on. It may happen that one of the sources that you require, the instruction currently being allocated requires, is currently being written back in the same cycle. All right, that can happen because in the same cycle, many things are happening. Something is being allocated, something is being executed, something is being written back. All right. So that so an instruction requires register R, which is being allocated in this cycle, and the instruction that produced R, the last instruction to produce R, is being written back in the same cycle. Okay. So this instruction comes, looks up the table, finds that the entry is one, thinks that well, it depends on this particular slot, and it goes there and waits forever because it's never going to be open up because that instruction has been written back. And um, so how do you resolve this? Is the race clear to everybody? Okay. Because in the next cycle, if you checked, of course, this entry would be zero. Okay. But in the cycle that you are getting allocated, there is a race going on. You are being allocated, same register is being written back. And you remember that the way pipeline works is that in a particular pipeline stage, it will sample all its inputs and then work on those inputs during the cycle and then make the modifications at the end of the cycle. Okay. So at the beginning of the cycle, it will sample the table, find out that this entry is one and will think that it's supposed to get the value from four. How do you solve this problem? Time out. You have to be very careful if you rely on timeout because there are the memory instructions have non-deterministic delay. You don't know how long they're going to take. What if this register is being produced by a memory instruction, which may be a legitimate dependence actually. If you time out too early, then. Okay, all right. So, okay. Okay, yes, that works. So, you're saying that periodically why don't you check this particular entry. All right, that, that makes sure that we'll make forward progress eventually. But we may end up losing a lot of cycles. Any better solution? Okay. So you're saying that you want to phase the, the execution. Sorry? No, see, the wake up happens when an instruction completes execution. You want to modify that? So, okay, so before I go to his solution, so what he has suggested is that why don't we have a phased execution that write back happens in the first half of the cycle and my allocation happens in the second half of the cycle. Okay, then the problem is solved because by the time allocate works, the table is up to date with this cycle's write back. All right? So I'll always get a consistent state in the table. Okay. That's one solution, but if I want a very high frequency processor, I may not be able to accommodate my write back in half cycle. Okay. Yes. You want to wake up after this? Huh? Okay. Uh, before, after is very fuzzy in a cycle. Uh, within a, when you are within a cycle, there is no meaning of before, after. Okay, these are all concurrent. They can happen at any point in time. Yes, so this one works. So what you do is, you divide your write back essentially into two parts. Okay. You spread it over two cycles. In the first cycle, you update your table. All right. Okay. So you mark this entry to be zero. All right, so that's what uh, this write back stage is doing. Okay, all right, and if you want, you can write the value also to the register file. Okay. In a second cycle, you broadcast 
this entry again over the queue. Okay, all right. So in case in the previous cycle somebody had a race, that guy will now wake up. Okay. And this cycle, if somebody is being allocated, it will actually see a zero value. So it will not wait. Okay, so that takes care of the problem actually. All right. Is it clear? Okay, splitting the write back into two cycles. Okay, all right. Sorry? There is only one broadcast per write back. Okay, so when this particular V0 is written back, in the first cycle, in the WB stage, it will reset this bit and it will write back the value also to the file. In the second cycle, it will broadcast 4. Okay, actually in this case, it will broadcast 4 along with the value. Okay, the value will also be needed. All right. So if anybody missed that bit in the last cycle, we'll wake up now okay. and pick up the value from the bypass and we'll go. Okay. Clear to everybody? More problem. So we said that um, this wake up stage is needed because this will wake up any waiting instruction which are waiting on some dependence. Okay, all right? So that they can now participate in the selection in the next cycle. Okay. So you can have the same race there between allocate and wake up. You are being allocated and your source register is also being generated in this very cycle. Okay. You are being woken up actually. So what will be the downside if I miss this particular wake up? Because there is a chance that I may miss it because I'm being allocated in this cycle. And um, so what will happen is that I'll go and look up the table. Table will say one here, let's say, okay. So I pick up four, but in this same cycle, four is being completed, okay, all right? But I'll miss that wake up signal. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna wait there until this is going to get written back when I'll be open up because of that broadcast, okay, of the second broadcast that we have put there. Sorry? No, it will be reset only when it's written back. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So I'm allocating instruction in this particular cycle which needs V0, all right? The instruction which is producing V0 is also completing in this cycle and is broadcasting this particular slot ID. So this instruction is going to miss this particular signal because there is a race going on. In the same cycle, you are being allocated and you are being open up. Okay. So this can't happen if we have two phases, right? two cycles. No, the point is that, okay, so maybe I should clarify. Okay, so let's go back to this. So these are ready to go, right? Okay. And uh, this is not yet ready, all right? So assume that this instruction is not yet allocated. Okay, all right? So now what is going to happen is that, um, let's see. So V0 is being produced by one, V1 is two, okay, all right, fine. Okay, so um, one, two, three are, are issued, they're executing, all right, they go through the memory stage, they're done executing. So now they complete, okay. So essentially I'm going to broadcast one, two, and three, they're complete now. All right. So when this broadcast happens in the same cycle, four is being allocated in the queue. Four looks up this table, finds that it depends on one and two. All right. So it goes in there, sits there waiting for one and two, which will never happen. Because one, two, and three have been broadcast in this cycle. So this instruction, which could have executed in the next cycle, will now wait until these two are written back, when they will be opened up. Is the is a, is a problem clear to everybody? Or you still don't see it? So what I'm saying is that you are now depending on this particular wake up to know that you are ready instead of this one because you missed this signal. In the same cycle, you are broadcasting one, two, and three. 
which all the instructions are supposed to compare against their dependence list, but this instruction is not yet here to compare anything against. It is still being allocated in this particular cycle. Okay. So we'll look up the table, we'll get to know its dependence correctly. It will mark one and two, will mark itself as not ready. And we'll wait there until these two are written back. When they will be again broadcast, and now they will pick up based on this. So there will be some lost cycles which we actually don't need. Is it clear? How do you solve this? One more bit in the table. In the table. Okay. You want a ready bit? You want a ready bit? All right, how does it help? When is this modified? As soon as it issues or when it completes execution? Which very same cycle? Well, execution, execution may not be one cycle, it may be multiple cycles. Last cycle. So then what's the difference? I mean, at that, that point I broadcast, right? The wake up also goes out. Okay, I see. Okay, yes. So you want to do this one cycle early. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we'll actually do the same solution. We're going to split up the wake up in two cycles. All right. So we're going to change the table entry here. So it's a ready bit which says that whether this particular value is ready or not. Okay. It may not be ready in the register file, but whether it is ready in this particular slots or not. Okay. All right. Q slots. So whenever the instruction executes, I may not be able to do it in the same cycle, maybe the next cycle. Okay. I'll first change this table entry to say that yes, this register is now ready. Okay, meaning that the value is ready. All right. And then in the next cycle, I'll do the wake up. So what will happen is that in this cycle, if somebody misses this, will be woken up in the next cycle. All right. And in the next cycle, if anybody comes, we'll actually get the correct value from the from the table. And all of them can now participate in selection in the next cycle. So essentially what I've done is that I've introduced one more cycle here. So I'll just call it wake up one and wake up two. Okay. So essentially what I'm doing is that I am, I'm essentially splitting the wake up into two, two state changes. Okay. So there are two states associated with the wake up now or associated with the write back. All right. So that gives you essentially what? An 11 stage pipeline. Okay. So these are pretty much a, a, a functional design. This is going to work. Okay. And the only limiter to your ILP is the length of the queue. How many instructions you can see at any point in time. If you have more, you will discover more independent ready instructions which can participate in the selection. Okay. And of course, you are limited by your register file ports you're limited by your number of functional units, how much can be issued. Also, we haven't discussed one thing, that is you're limited by the rate at which the queue can drain. Okay, and that depends on what? Write ports, the number of write ports in a register file. Because if I want to drain three entries every cycle, I better have three write ports in my register file. Okay, all right, because I may have to send three values to the register file. So um, if you have an unbounded Q, you will be limited, and if you have unbounded register file ports, if you have an unbounded functional units, you will be limited only by flow dependence, nothing else. Only data flow will be the limiter. Okay. You will get all other ILPs possible in your program. And to notice what is going to happen with this particular piece of code, your Q will actually fill up, even though the seventh instruction is a branch instruction. Assuming that this branch predictor here, which will be looked up here actually, okay, whenever the seventh instruction is fetched, um, and if it tells you the right thing, it will actually keep on filling the queue in the right direction with right instructions. Okay. And then your selection hardware will actually, in this case, although it may not be possible because of this dependence, uh, these two loads will depend on this particular one, and then you have very various other uh, dependent instructions. Okay. But otherwise, uh, nothing stops you from picking up ready instructions from different iterations. Okay. 
all right <coughs> okay any question so your book gives a slightly different description of this uh, it has a different uh, organization of this queue um, and it also maintains this particular table in a slightly different way and we'll actually so by the way so this is actually not implemented in any processor in this way never okay um, can anybody guess what is the problem so the, here i have a single queue right length of queue yes i want a very large queue so what can't i have one large queue it's not bounded no it will be bounded to some length let's say 200 entries Broadcast. Why? How many comparisons? Yes. Right. So, how many comparisons? How can, yeah, how many? So, so the number of write backs that can be done in a cycle is the number of entries. Why? Is it? Yeah, two into the number. Two into the number of entries, right? So, per entry, I can do at most two comparisons. That's the worst case, multiplied by number of entries. So, in the worst case, every cycle in a 200 queue design, 200 entry queue design, I'll be making 400 comparisons every cycle, okay, right? And possibly to accommodate these 400 comparisons in my short cycle time, I'll be doing all of them in parallel, right? I have to do them, which means I need 400 comparators, okay, in my particular design, which is probably out of question. Okay. Yes. Right, but per entry can make only two comparisons, right? Compare with every every broadcast ID, yeah, exactly. So, yes. So, what is the number? Suppose I I, I can write W entries in a cycle. W into n into, w into, n into two. So, so does everybody see why why is that? Whenever I broadcast one entry, that will be compared against both of these for every entry. Okay, right? So, n into W into two. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, that's pretty large actually, it's very large. So how do I solve this? I cannot get rid of the broadcast. That's fundamental to this design actually. That everybody needs to compare. That cannot be taken away. So number of comparators, uh, can it be reduced? There is more. Um, other than this wake up, there are other comparisons involving load store operations, we are, I've just mentioned, right? So suppose that I have a constraint that load instructions will not issue until all the stores before it, before it have completed, all right? So I have this particular constraint, okay? So um, whenever a store is issued, what it does is that it doesn't write the value to memory, but it computes the address, okay? It goes to the execution stage, computes the address and stores it in, in a separate, uh, filled in this particular entry, okay. So whenever a load instruction wants to issue, it first checks that all the stores have been completed before it, okay. That's the first constraint. And let's suppose that yes, they have all completed, but there are a bunch of stores before it actually, which haven't yet written to memory, all right. So what it will do is, it will issue, compute its address, and then broadcast the address over all the queue entries for comparing against the stores which have completed. And if anybody matches, the load has to be called back. Okay, all right, load has to be called back. It will take the value from the store's entry. It cannot take the value from memory. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, because the load is supposed to consume this value, not something that is in the memory. So that actually increases your number of comparators even further. You need address comparators. So these are uh, QID comparators. So these are dependence comparators. In addition to that, you need address comparators. So 
So what do you do? How do you reduce this overhead? This, the storage is not not a problem. A 200 entry queue is okay actually. Okay. So you want a list of dependents here, as opposed to storing who I depend on. You want to store who I need to source. Okay, all right. But this list may be unbounded, right? So how do I size it then? Because this 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 has to be this has to be done in the silicon, which will be fixed at design time. You cannot increase it at runtime, saying that oh I need more. <laughs> Yeah, which is which is gigantic, right? Yes. Hash table. Will that reduce your number of uh, comparisons? It will reduce W. How? What is the organization of the table? Now, what is my hash key? IDs. Okay. All right. No, no, tell me the organization of one entry. What does it contain? All these things, same. So then what is the difference? Huh? Okay, so I will continue from here next time. So I'll stop here today. Okay. Based on the means? Uh, can you little bit more? So who all are depending on that register? Okay, so you want to attach a list of dependents with a register, but the list of dependents is unbounded. I mean, not unbounded, but it's based on so that still is large, right? Yeah, but you are having so many uh, things on each issue. You mean you mean so many fields? Not too many. This this is, see, I'm saying storage is not a problem actually. The problem is the operation that you are doing on this storage. That is the problem. You have gigantic caches on chip. That's not a problem really. The problem is the kind of operations you are doing. So anyway, so we'll continue from here next time. We'll see how today's processors actually handle this problem. But keep in mind that this is the model. Okay, this is now essentially we'll do small tweaks on this to make sure that this is this becomes implementable. Okay.